Hello, this is Michael Twardowski at Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute, and uh, I'll be talking to you about remarkable technologies to explore the ocean. And usually this is an in-person talk, but unfortunately we can't do that this year. Um, I do have my email address on the slide, so uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to, uh, to email me and uh, I will be sure to promptly respond. So just to give you some quick background for me, um, I got a Bachelor's of Science degree at Trinity University in Texas, then I did a PhD in Oceanography at University of Rhode Island, Graduate School of Oceanography, and then I did a, a postdoctoral fellowship at Oregon State University with a guy named Ron Zonnefeld, who's one of the kind of grandfathers of the field of science that um, I've pursued in my career. Currently a professor at uh, H. Boy, Florida Atlantic, and also affiliate professor in ocean engineering. We also have a company, Sunstone Scientific, where we do some oceanographic research and calibrations for instruments and sell some instruments, that kind of thing. My former position was director of research and vice president for a company called Wet Labs that manufactured sensors for oceanographic research. And my research is focused in an area called ocean optics, which uh, this entire presentation is, is mostly about. So you'll have a, a much better idea of what ocean optics entails by the end of this talk. We do a lot of sensor development in this field. Most of my research is funded by NASA and the Navy. NASA funded work is primarily in what's called ocean color, where we have an imaging, imaging systems on satellites that look at the ocean and based on the color, we can glean a lot of information about the types of stuff that's in the water. So I'll talk about that more um, in a minute. And then with the Navy, done a lot of different research for the Navy over the years. The current research is really focused on developing CubeSat imaging systems to observe the ocean. And also bioluminescence research. We have a sizable project right now in bioluminescence that uh, we'll be working on for the next three to four years. And these are, uh, this is an older picture, but uh, all these people are still uh, in the lab except for Brandon on the left there. But um, our lab over the years is about doubled in this size relative to this size. Uh, if you see Mike there, second from the right, that's me. And everybody else here are either a professor at Harbor Branch or a technician, a graduate student, a postdoc. So engineer, so we have uh, a lot of different people who um, all contribute in really meaningful ways to all of our research. So this slide kind of uh, summarizes really a lot of what I'll be talking about today. And uh, this is a nice slide from Tommy Dickey in 2008. And it looks at various uh, ocean processes as a function of time and the spatial scale at which they operate. So at the largest scales, you have things like climate change. And um, you know, climate change can only be resolved over time periods of at least 10 years, typically you know, decades to centuries. Obviously, geological time scales go back millions to hundreds of millions, billions of years. So um, those are the kind of time scales that we need to to measure something over in the ocean if we want to really look at climate change. It's important to make that distinction that it's only over very long periods of time. So for instance, in Texas right now, we have extremely cold weather and they haven't had this kind of cold snap going back for many decades. So you might ask yourself, well, how could we be having climate change and global warming if they're having extremely cold weather in Texas? That's because it's a very isolated incident and climate change is evaluated over many years. So if you look at the average temperature in Texas over the last decade or 50 years or 100 years, it's the highest it's been on record. So um, that's climate change. So in the ocean, the kinds of things that we look at on those kinds of scales are things like the El Nino Southern Oscillation, ENSO in the upper right there. Um, 
and and these kinds of very large climate change effects in the ocean um, also occur over spatial scales that basically include the entire entire planet. So uh, ENSO is a, a planetary um, phenomenon, and uh, these are things that you know affect for us in Florida, for instance, um, hurricane frequency and the power of hurricanes. Um, when we look at global warming and we look at temperature rises in the ocean, that affects things like current dynamics in the ocean. And currents affect not only productivity throughout the ocean, so the plants, the small plants called phytoplankton that grow in the ocean, and um, how productive they are, which is linked to how much carbon dioxide they're drawing out of the atmosphere through their photosynthetic processes. But uh, temperature affects current dynamics, and uh, current dynamics are largely responsible for the weather that we have on our planet. It's, you know, the reason we have a huge Gulf Stream, for instance, that rides up the east coast of the United States, pumps a lot of heat into northern latitudes, which is why Europe, which is a relatively high northern latitude continent, um, is uh, relatively warm. If it didn't have the Gulf Stream, it'd be much, much colder. So uh, when we have temperature changes that can create different current dynamics, can drastically change uh, weather on our planet. So that's why climate change is so important. So that's in the upper right. And we can go all the way to the lower left. And we have molecular processes that happen on very short time scales and very short spatial scales. And then between, we have all of these different physical phenomena. If you'd like, you could pause the video and, and take a look at this and digest all of these processes a little bit more if you'd like. But what I'm talking about today is technology. And technology, um, the different technological advances, is what we use to resolve these various processes that we're interested in for various science application science reasons. Um, so one of those um, pieces of technology is tethered moorings. So this is obviously tethered in one location. So the spatial scale is relatively narrow. But some of these moorings that we've had in the ocean, particularly in the Pacific, um, have been out for decades. So we have very long time series of various events that occur in the ocean. And uh, they can measure in relatively, um, you know, small t temporal scales. So it's even though it's been out there for a long period of time, it's collecting data. You know, you can collect data potentially as as frequently as every minute, but typically it's on the order of half an hour to an hour. And then uh, you know you can look at things like phytoplankton blooms and and their waxing and waning, and then zooplankton grazing on the blooms, uh, plankton migrations that happen, which I'll talk about in a little bit more in a minute. So there's a lot of different processes that can be resolved with tethered moorings. Then we have satellites. And satellites are terrific because in a day or two, we can map out a parameter for the entire planet. You get full planetary coverage in a day or two. It's the only piece of technology that's even close to being able to do that. So it's very, very powerful. Um, and, uh, you know, you can look at relatively fine scales. Some some um, imaging systems that we have in space that are, they pro pro provide commercially available images, you know, of the ocean can resolve down to meter scales. So quite, quite um, high resolution. And there are some very high resolution that uh, Department of Defense um, and those kinds of agencies um, also employ that are even much finer than that. So uh, there's a variety of very important um, physical phenomena in the ocean that you can resolve with satellites, as you can see in this box. And uh, some of these satellites have been up for over a decade. So uh, we start to then look at climate change scale phenomena and we try to do the first satellite to observe the ocean for ocean color went up in the late 1970s and we've only had one gap um, so what we try to do is as these satellites get older and they phase out those imaging systems we try to launch a new imaging system that's better that continues that that record it's very very important
to do that for climate change analyses. There's also geostationary satellites. So instead of polar orbiting satellites that map out the whole planet in a day or two, these are satellites that are much higher altitude, around 35,000 kilometers. And at that altitude, you're basically, you can maintain a fixed position over the Earth as it rotates. So your orbit is basically synchronized with the movement of the planet. So you can look at one spot continuously. And um, again, there's a, a, you know, some of these have been out for many, many years. And you have uh, in that one location that you're looking at hundreds of kilometers that you're resolving. So there's a lot of oceanographic processes that can be resolved. And then research vessels, of course, this is kind of the conventional approach that goes back really to the 19th century. Um, and today there's a fleet of research vessels that are maintained through federal funding throughout the United States at the major oceanographic institutes. We used to have uh, a regional class, a large regional class vessel here at Harbor Branch. We don't currently have one. Um, but anyway, there's obviously a, a large um, number of physical phenomena in the ocean that can be resolved um, from very fine scales to uh, quite large scales and these vessels can be out for months at a time. There's also overflights. So overflights, you know, you can fly over the ocean at say, you know, kilometer type altitude relative to 450 kilometers with a satellite. So uh, because of that, you're much closer. So the, the resolution that you get for looking at fine scale phenomena in the ocean is much, much higher. Autonomous underwater vehicles. So this is a relatively new development. It's really only gained widespread use in our community really since about 2000. And um, these come in a variety of different flavors that I'll talk about in more detail in a minute. Some of them are propelled, some of them glide, some of them float. But they can be out for long periods of time and they can cover uh, large swaths of the ocean. And relative to taking a, a research vessel out in the ocean, they're far, far more, they're far, far more um, economical. So uh, a research vessel, and a good research vessel is a global class or regional class research vessel, costs about fifty to sixty thousand dollars a day to operate. So they're very expensive. Whereas for fifty or sixty thousand dollars, you could get an autonomous vehicle and send it out to make all these measurements for you, and then program it so that it returns back to base, and uh, you can download your data. So. Um, now we have fleets of these AUVs throughout the ocean, which I'll talk a little bit more about. So it's giving us a tremendous amount of information that can never be gleaned just from research vessels alone. Profiling floats, those are a form of AUVs. Um, it's a special form. Um, they just, every two weeks, they sit, they sit at about two kilometers depth in the ocean and every two weeks they take a profile to the surface they send their data through a satellite link and then they go back down to 2,000 meters. And um, some of these have been out for many, many years and we have thousands out in the ocean. So these are some of the most important network of instrumentation that we have to, to study various phenomena, especially things like global warming temperature increases. And so when you look at uh, combining all of these different pieces of technology, you uh, Try what we try to do is depending on the research topic that we're interested in, you pick the kind of technology that you want. And by you know looking at suites of technologies, you can really look at all of these processes. So the key breakthrough, breakthroughs in oceanography have been the result of technological innovation. So these various platforms and the sensing technologies on the platforms. And with all the pl platforms, there's trade-offs. So size, weight, cost of operation things like power um, and uh, yeah, cost is, is, a, is a big factor and that's why things like AUVs have become so popular relative to things like research vessels. And so we've developed uh, some observatories around the United States and uh, there are local observatories. The two big federal observatories are the Na National Science Foundation Ocean Observing Initiative, OOI, 
and the NOAA Integrated Ocean Observing System, IOOS, IUS. And there are 11 different IUS observatories um, around the United States and um, in the Pacific. The, uh, the regional observatory that we have uh, that includes the Florida Peninsula is called Sakura. So, uh, as I mentioned, remote sensing is a super powerful uh, technique for resolving uh, phenomena on, on Earth as well as in outer space. So remote sensing, in very, very generically, is getting information without making physical contact. Um, ocean color satellite imagery is based on passive reflectance of sunlight from the ocean. So it's just like if you stand on a bridge and look at the ocean or you look at the IRL, for instance, Indian River Lagoon, it's got a certain color to it and we can resolve those colors in great detail. Um, the color information is what's called the spectral information. Light travels in a property of light as it travels as a wave and the wavelength of that wave defines its color. So uh, we can have imaging systems that are designed to look at a whole, uh, that whole spectrum of wavelengths through the, the visible range, but also including longer wavelength into the IR and shorter wave wavelength into the UV. We have imaging systems that can resolve that spectral range that's important for biology and gathering information about the ocean with a lot of uh, detail. And the way it works, if you look at the picture in the lower left, sunlight goes into the water, it is absorbed by the different particles in the water, such as phytoplankton. Phytoplankton have pigments to collect light because they use that light energy in photosynthesis, just like land plants. So land plants are green because of a, of a pigment called chlorophyll. And the um, plants in the ocean also use chlorophyll, so that's why when there's blooms of organisms in the ocean, the water turns green as well. And then the different particles and substances in the ocean also scatter light. So you have this, these two processes, absorption of light and scattering of light, and each is done selectively with respect to color. So uh, that selective absorption due to chlorophyll is what turns it green, and then the scattering is what uh, scatters some of that light back up to the surface of the water and then out of the water and that's what's measured by the satellite or your eye looking off a bridge or the the deck of a ship and then we also if you see the radiometer on the boat we have very sensitive light meters that we can put on boats to look at that scatter light um, that's originating from the sun and then it's, it's scattered and absorbed by all the stuff in the water column but that selective absorption and selective scattering by all the stuff in the water column and, and, and all the properties that it gives the reflected light coming out of the water, it, there's a lot of information that, that we can, that as a community, we've been um, getting, uh, that we've been, we've been gleaning information about the stuff that's in the water. So the types of particles, the concentration of the particles and pigments, the size of the particles. There's a lot of information that you can get from the quality of that light that's scattered out of the water. And that's that really summarizes the ocean color um, community and uh, what we do with satellite imagery. So I talked about phytoplankton. So these are the, the plants of the sea and they're microscopic and uh, they come in a, a vast, vast range of sizes and shapes. So here's a few of them. Um, we have diatoms and we have dinoflagellates and uh, many other types of, of phytoplankton. These are single-celled organisms, but sometimes they form chains. So on the left, you can see a diatom that's formed a chain and they have these thin glass um, structures that keep the chain together. Uh, if, if, you, if you inject a lot of turbulence, the chains break up. The catoceris, which is a diatom on the far right, um, that forms these helical type chains. And uh, you can see that these, they've got these um, glass spikes or glass hairs that radiate from the cells. So this, all these cells come in 
just an incredible variety of very, very complex shapes. And one of the things that we're interested in oceanography is just understanding why they come in these incredible variety of shapes. It's really fascinating. So they use chlorophyll to harvest light. There's many other pigments that these organisms also use to harvest light. And it depends on where they live in the ocean. So if you're, if you're living in very, very blue, clear water, then you have, you have the, the, the spectral character of the sunlight coming in is different because it's, it's filtered differently by the stuff that's in the water. So you can use pigments to harvest that light. And if you're in very, very green water, for instance, like in the lower right picture, you'd want to use other pigments to harvest that light along with chlorophyll. And about half of the Earth's photosynthesis occurs in our oceans. So it's, it's a very important contribution to the global photosynthesis and the global, obviously in photosynthesis, you're sucking up carbon dioxide to convert it into glucose, a plant material, ultimately. So um, that feeds into the whole global carbon cycle because carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. So that's one of the most important things affecting the concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere and the degree to which our atmosphere is acting like a greenhouse effect. So uh, satellites, this is one picture of chlorophyll that has been derived from the color information from satellites. And this is a particular satellite called SeaWIFS that operated for about 10 years. And one of the most important um, records that we have, and it was a very, uh, it was a, just a satellite imaging system that performed very well. Um, I'm gonna click on this video here. So what this is showing is the seasonal chlorophyll changes on the planet for about a 10 year period. You can see on the, when we have these west coast locations, we get chlorophyll blooms that occur. And that's because of the current systems as the earth turns, essentially the water is pushed off the coast. And when it's pushed off the coast, deep water that's rich in nutrients gets upwelled along the western shoreline and that's why we have chlorophyll blooms when you have nutrients mixed with sunlight phytoplankton and other plants plants on land as well grow really well so we have blooms that occur on these western shorelines all around the planet as the planet rotates around from west to east um, you see along the equator as well oftentimes there's enhanced chlorophyll that's also because of upwelling Seasonally, you can see the monsoon effects in the Arabian Sea. They have very intense blooms seasonally. Here along the west coast of Africa, you see these very intense blooms. That's also due to upwelling because of the rotation of the planet. So there's a, a just a tremendous wealth of information here. You can see the, if you look fine at the fine scale, uh, it's really mesoscale, so on the order of kilometers, um, shapes of chlorophyll in the ocean, they form these eddies. And before the first satellite was launched in the late 70s, um, this was never understood. So uh, it's just, we take it for granted these days, but there's just so much we've learned from satellite imagery of, of chlorophyll in the ocean. You can see in the North Atlantic here, there's a spring bloom, an increase in chlorophyll in the spring, and then an increase in chlorophyll also in the fall. So we get this kind of um, bimodal distribution of chlorophyll, chlorophyll throughout the year, whereas at the poles, we only have a single uh, summer bloom, which is happening right there in the, in the video. So tons of information um, can be gleaned from, uh, from satellite imagery of, of ocean color. This is an ocean color image of Western Lake Erie here, and uh, you can see the chlorophyll concentration is very high. Um, this is due to nutrient runoff from agriculture in the region, which causes very intense blooms of cyanobacteria that are also toxic. So sometimes in the summers, the summer they have to close down uh, drinking water facilities because of these blooms. But you can see that in the structure of the chlorophyll, you see eddies there in kind of the central lake area. area. There's also, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but you see these lines here, these lines in the chlorophyll, those are due to internal waves actually. Those are waves under the surface of the water that propagate um, across the entire basin. 
and you can see that from satellites you can't see that really any other way from unless you're looking remotely so ocean color uh, you know obviously as you guys know in different areas the water looks different and uh, in California coast which is in the west coast and they have a lot of upwelling and that's why the water is cold because you have this cold deep water that's upwelled there brings nutrients to the surface again comes in contact with light you get phytoplankton growth it's very favorable conditions for phytoplankton growth so the water turns green so uh, you know you can derive a chlorophyll concentration based on the color of the water and then in the middle there we have the Mediterranean Sea which is blue which is uh, much cleaner obviously than the California coast but it's clean it's not really super clean you know pure water and that's what we get in the South Pacific Ocean so the South Pacific Ocean there in the lower right um, this was a cruise that I was on in 2004 when you have almost pure water it actually looks violet and it's incredibly bright it kind of hurts your eyes um, but it's, it's really it's really beautiful violet water there's many different technologies that we use to uh, study the ocean via ocean color remote sensing. So SeaWaves, as I mentioned, was a, a, a imaging system that went on a satellite and it operated for about 10 years. It had eight different colors, eight bands that uh, we used for um, algorithms to derive things like chlorophyll concentration, particle concentration, biomass in the ocean, that kind of thing. We also have um, to develop our algorithms so these are the algorithms that interpret satellite data to give us derived constituents in the water we have to uh, make our own light measurements and then um, also measure like stuff like chlorophyll that we're really interested in deriving and make um, the algorithms essentially link the light measurements to the physical quantities of the materials that we're trying to resolve in the water so we use profiling radiometers to measure light fields. And these are also used to validate what the satellite imaging systems are giving us. There's also above water radiometers. And this is a buoy called MOVI, which stands for Marine Optics Buoy. And it's one of a kind. It's deployed in the Pacific um, off the coast of Hawaii in super clear water with a very, very clear atmosphere. And uh, these long arms that you can see coming off the main axle of the buoy are very, very sensitive custom light meters. And uh, this, the light measured with this buoy, this is the only buoy in the world that's used to actually calibrate um, and to correct for things like drift over time for satellites. So it's a very important um, measurement it's been up for over I would say 20 years um, so it's a very important program for our community they're profiling floats so these things these guys are the ones that I mentioned that hang out at about 2,000 meters for say about every two weeks they then go to the surface take a profile of all these different parameters to the water column uh, depending on what sensors are on the profiling float send their data at the surface via satellite and then go back down to 2,000 meters and then on ships we can make uh, very high resolution measurements of various uh, parameters that tell us how light propagates through the water so these are actually measuring like when I mentioned absorption and scattering are the two main processes in water that affects how light propagates through water we can quantify those very um, carefully with this kind of instrumentation and then similar instrumentation instead of vertical profiling we can put it on this guy with the yellow wings and tow this behind a boat and it can undulate and um, it gives us kind of a ribbon once you interpolate it gives you a ribbon of data two dimensionally which I'll talk about more in a minute so as far as ocean color remote sensing uh, as I mentioned, CWIS was a, a platform that we had up for about 10 years. It ended in 2006. Then we've had MODIS is another one um, in Europe. France put one up called Maris. Currently, there's one called Sentinel that's put up by the European Union. The next 
big imaging system for ocean color is called PACE. Uh, and that's uh, the next big NASA mission that we're all very excited about. I'm currently on the PACE uh, science team. And what we're trying to do now is develop the algorithms so that we can um, use the data from this imaging system as well as possible to resolve different parameters um, in the ocean. Uh, it's very sensitive, so it has many, many different colors, I think over 200 different colors. And uh, the pixel resolution will be about one kilometer squared throughout the ocean. Um, and launch will be from Kennedy, actually, uh, either at the end of 2023 or beginning of 2024. So we're very excited about that. It'll be sure to be there. At Harbor Branch, um, I also have two projects funded by the Navy to develop imaging systems for ocean color, but they're uh, much, much more compact. We deploy these on what's called CubeSats. CubeSats are defined by what's called a U, which is one unit, which is 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. So it's very, very uh, compact. And this is a, a CubeSat that we're developing here on the left. It's called SlimSat. And uh, the imaging system will look out the bottom of this thing. A optical diagram, a diagram of the optical train of the system is, is on the right here where it says camera. And uh, just very generally, it's got a telescope to collect the light, and then it goes to something called a spectrometer, which disperses the light into the various colors, and then that's imaged onto an array. And uh, we actually expect to get 84 different colors, and if we can do this with this very compact package, it would be a real advancement in our community, so something we're really excited about. And we have two of these projects, so there's two different imagers that we're developing right now uh, for the Navy. So uh, now I'm going to kind of go through the different measurements that we make uh, in the ocean. So remote sensing is one way that we can study the ocean on a kind of very synoptic global scale, which is incredibly uh, powerful. Uh, when we make, make measurements off research vessels, these are kind of a lot of the sensors that we use. Um, and they're all kind of nestled in this cage here. but. Um, they measure things, like I mentioned, like particularly for what we're interested in understanding how light propagates through the ocean. They measure the absorption and scattering properties. But there's also sensors to measure things like the depth of the package as we deploy it through the water column, the temperature of the water, the salinity of the water. There's a device on here for looking at the size distributions of particles. So uh, we have a lot of different instrumentation in the lab that we can affix to the frame depending on what uh, the science question is we're trying to answer in any particular field mission. And then we also collect samples. And we do that with uh, a frame called uh, a Niskin bottle. Um, well, these are Niskin bottles on the frame. So each one of those, those vertical like long tubular gray things is, is a Niskin bottle. And as you drop this in the water, you, you lower it through the water. And then as it's lowered, you can trip the bottle so the ends close and it traps a water sample from different depths. So if you have 20 different Niskin bottles, you can potentially collect discrete samples from 20 different depths in the ocean. So we do that. This is how we directly measure things like chlorophyll. We'll collect a discrete sample with one of these bottles. Once it's put back on the deck of the ship, we'll take a, a bottle that we have, fill it from the bottle that just collected it from the ocean, and bring it to the lab. We'll filter all of the particles onto a filter, and then we can do an extraction of the chlorophyll pigment, and that's how we quantify chlorophyll. We can also weigh the particles on that filter to understand the biomass of the particulate material in the oceans. There's a variety of different things that we can do uh, with the discrete samples which, once we collect them. Uh, this is a, a really, really interesting research vessel that I wanted to bring to you guys' attention. It's called FLIP, and uh, it, was, it was in service for about 60 years. It was just decommissioned, which is really incredible. It was built in 1962. 
And this is a 355 foot long barge, so it has to be towed out into the middle of the ocean. And then it's what's called a, a spar buoy design. So what they do is they start filling one end of the, the barge with water. And as it's filled with water, it flips. So you can see in the lower left here, it going through the sequ sequence of flipping. And then when it's uh, fully vertical, it's fully filled, it looks like the middle picture here, which is a, a picture I took in 2008 when we were doing some research on, on this vessel. And this vessel, the reason it's a spar buoy design, a spar buoy means that you have a lot of mass under the water air-sea interface and what that gives you is a platform that's decoupled from wave action. So as waves go by, the platform doesn't bob up and down. And because of that, like this is a one of a kind vessel uh, that nobody else had around the world and nobody still does. Um, and this, this vessel was used to collect almost all of the uh, cutting edge, like the best quality wave data that has ever been measured. And that actually goes back to the 60s. It was a very, very important platform for the oceanographic community for, for many, many years. And you can see it's got these booms that can be um, affixed off various ends of the platform. And here's you know, a guy laying down on it right here and a guy standing up. And what they're doing is they're working on their instruments. These are typically uh, laser based instruments that look at reflected light off the water surface and as the waves go by they can resolve the wave characteristics very carefully. But you can see here it's a one, two, three, four um, platform, four story um, laboratory essentially that's completely open to the uh, atmosphere and in these different platforms everybody, all the scientists has have all their gear where they're looking at the data from the instruments that they deploy on these booms. And uh, on one platform is a kitchen. What's really incredible is as, as this rotates around, the entire kitchen is on an axle, so the entire kitchen rotates around. All the toilets, the plumbing doesn't work, you know, once you rotate. So all the, pl all the toilets have to be, they have two holes. One's in the wall and then one's in the floor. And then when it rotates, the one that was in the floor is now on the wall. It has to be... Um, uh, repositioned to the hole that was in the wall is now on the floor. So it's a uh, it's a really fascinating vessel to uh, to work from. So moving from uh, oceanographic research vessels, uh, there's also ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, and uh, these are very useful when you have a lot of kind of detailed measurements that you need to be done, like seafloor mapping or, or sampling bottom, that kind of thing, in a, in a limited area. So they're relatively expensive and you get limited aerial coverage, but for a lot of you know, interest, it's exactly what you want in terms of trying to look at things like hydrothermal vents, which are areas like, like around Mid-Atlantic Ridge where you get black smokers, you get this energy from the earth that comes up through these black smokers and there are chemosynthetic organisms that grow there. So you have this whole ecosystem around black smokers. So ROVs can be used to, um, to sample those kind of um, limited area areas of interest. There's also propelled uh, autonomous underwater vehicles. Um, the hydroid Remus on the left there, uh, that's a picture from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and their fleet of Remus vehicles. So they come from the Remus, they range from the Remus 100, which is the smaller one, all the way to very, very large ones like the Remus 6000, I think it is. Um, and they have, depending on the size and capabilities, they have a variety of different depth ranges. Their ranges typically are 10 to 1,000 kilometers. 1,000 kilometers are obviously one of the larger ones. You can put all kinds of different sensors on it. Um, so this is um, you know, very important for a lot of our sampling. You can sample under ice. It's one of the only ways to sample under ice, like in the Arctic and Antarctic. So um, these are very valuable tools for, for our community. Currently at Harbor Branch, we have one Remus vehicle and uh, through the bioluminescence project, I just ordered another one. They're very expensive, so they cost just that one, that little Remus 100 
um, with the, the entire system is going to cost over a million dollars. So they're quite expensive. And the lower rate is uh, much, much less expensive. Riptide, these are really cute. These are only maybe half a meter long and they're quite affordable on the, well, on the order of uh, say $15,000. And uh, you can put obviously more compact sensors uh, on there. Um, and the, the batteries allows, I think, for maybe a few hours of, of operation. Yeah, and you can do things, you can do all kinds of things, but you can do things like map coral beds, um, but there's a variety of different applications. You can put imaging systems, like optical imaging systems. You can also put acoustic systems on there to look at currents, map out currents. Um, you can map out organism distributions with acoustic uh, responses, similar to the fish finder. Profiling floats. So the way these operate is they have a bladder and a pump, and the pump um, pumps in seawater. As it pumps in seawater into a cavity, it becomes negatively buoyant and it starts to drop through the water column. And then when it pumps out water again, then it will rise to the surface. So um, these are, are very, very useful. Uh, the Argo floats in particular there in the middle uh, there are thousands of these deployed around the world currently, and this is uh, one of the most important platforms that we have for looking at global temperature distributions because of the global network that we have, and that was one of the primary impetus for developing that, that program. But you can put all different types of, of sensors on the right. Here, the Navis OC float is a float that really specializes in optical measurements, so looking at um, light fields through the water column. You can measure chlorophyll concentration on these floats. So the analytical way that I mentioned before is you collect a sample, bring it to the lab, and then do an analytical measurement of chlorophyll. But chlorophyll fluoresces, which means that you can excite it with blue light and it will glow red. And you can do this with spinach in your laboratory. If you have a blue flashlight or a blue um, you know, laser, just a, a little pen laser, um, you can see it glow red. And you can use that, that, that phenomenon to quantify the concentration of chlorophyll. And so you, we have these little chlorophyll fluorometers that we can put on these floats. And this is a nice study from a colleague of mine, Emmanuel Boss. We actually shared a, um, an office in Oregon State when I was doing my postdoc there. But what he did was he had a float that was at, out for several years in the Labrador Sea, and it quantified mixed layer depth here is quantified through temperature, so a thermocline. And so the bottom of the thermocline is the bottom of your mixed layer depth. And you can see in the winter time, it can get very, very deep. So this means that above the therm above this mixed layer depth is basically well mixed. And so in the, in the winter, you have a lot of storm energy and that can mix to very deep depths. And then in the summer, you have stratification and when you have stratification, typically you have high chlorophyll concentrations. And that's what the, the lower plot shows. So this is chlorophyll concentration as a function of time. In the summer, you have these big peaks in chlorophyll concentration from the summer blooms that happen in northern latitudes. And uh, what this shows is his satellite data agreed with measurements of chlorophyll derived from floats. Sorry, so the chlorophyll derived from satellites measured with the, the data he measured directly with fluorescence, chlorophyll fluorescence from the floats. So this is a very nice study. So these Argo floats that I mentioned, um, this is their distribution. This is from, uh, I think, two years ago, uh, and it says 3308 active floats in the lower left there. Currently, I just looked it up an hour ago, and it's actually 3,921 now. Um, so you have excellent global coverage. Um, this is showing only one float in the Arctic Ocean, but now there are several. Um, and you can see that um, this is a, a very, this is a global program. It's a globally coordinated program with many, many different countries that are involved. We also have gliders. So this is the spray glider here, the orange one. We have one of these here at um, Harbor Branch. 
There's also something called the Sea Glider from the University of Washington Applied Physics Lab. And uh, these you deploy at the surface and they go down to depth and they come back to the surface. And uh, these use significantly less energy than propelled underwater vehicles because if you're propelled, obviously it creates, you have to use a lot of energy to operate the propeller. These have wings that uh, typically are fixed and it's just like a profiling float and then it has a bladder and a pump. So it, all you have to do when you're at the surface is pump in some water, and which doesn't use a whole lot of energy. Then you're negatively buoyant and you just glide through the water column. So as you're gliding downward, you're not using any energy. So these are very energy efficient platforms. And once you get to the bottom, you pump out that water and then you just glide to the surface. And um, this is a study back in about 2008 where uh, we had a Slocum glider from Teledyne Webb, which is in the upper right there. And through Navy funding, we developed new sensors for it, which is in the lower right here, the SAM, which is looking at scattering off particles so we can quantify how many particles are in the water. And the picture above it, you can see all the little particles that are in the water. And that's what, that's what all these sensors do. They look at things like scattering of particles, but also fluorescence to get things like chlorophyll concentration. And then these middle plots here show, a, show like one of, the, one of the deployments from one of these gliders. This is actually in the Hudson River outflow. So you can see at the top with salinity here, uh, plot A, it's relatively low salinity at the surface, highest salinity is at the bottom and that's because if you have higher salinity typically well you're always more dense so um, low density water at the surface high density water with high salinity at the bottom um, and then this attenuation and backscatter this backscatter is looking at particles so the Hudson River plume at the surface had a lot of particles that uh, it was bringing out into the water basically pancaking at the surface but there's also a lot of particles near the bottom here, and this is due to bottom resuspension. So there's a lot of different things that you can look at with uh, these platforms. Very, very cool. And these can be out for you know months at a time. Uh, Rutgers, which is the uh, the university that owned that glider, they uh, I think it was maybe two years ago they sent the glider all the way from New Jersey to the UK. So uh, it was out I think for two months. This is a tow vehicle uh, in my lab. We call this the dolphin, and uh, it undulates through the water column. Uh, you pull it behind the ship, and then these yellow wings uh, undulate up and down. They rotate up and down so that the whole package undulates through the water column. And you can do stuff like this. Um, this was uh, in the Mediterranean in 2009. There's a buoy called Boussole, and it's also an optical buoy, so it has you know, sensors on it to measure light field and various properties of the water that determine how, how light propagates through the water. But we did a spiral tow around the buoy. And uh, you can see in the upper left here, the undulations of, of the, the tow vehicle as it goes around in the spiral. And uh, then you can interpolate across the spiral and then you have a three-dimensional block of data that you can use. So what we were using it for ocean color and when, like I mentioned before, like with the new PACE satellite, its resolution is about one kilometer squared globally. So uh, we're trying, we were trying to estimate just how much variability in that one kilometer squared do you have in the ocean. And that's what this derived surface refle reflectance plot shows. So this box here is basically one kilometer squared. Um, and you can see because of the resolution of the measurements that we made, there is variability in there. But this scale is relatively small. We're going from 0 0.0192 to 0 0.0204. So it's a relatively small range. There's also a platform called Drifters that we uh, use sometimes. Uh, this is a drifter that we deployed on the left in the Southern Ocean for a gas exchange experiment in 2008. And uh, it was about two meters tall and there were a whole variety of different sensors that were uh, fixed to it. 
This was um, one of the main things that we wanted to know. And the reason why we were in the Southern Ocean is in the Southern Ocean, um, you basically have an area where if you move around that latitude on the planet, there's no land, which means that the wind has terrific fetch, which means you get huge waves. And because of that, um, there's a lot of uh, air injection, a lot of things like carbon dioxide and other gases are injected. So we wanted to understand that process better. And so, um, and then once the gas was injected, where did it go? And that's what the drifter could tell us. So the drifters can track currents and they can also track, track things um, like if you have a, a dye getting injected or, or a gas where it goes. So dyes are used to basically as a tracer to figure out flows and currents in the ocean. We also developed um, these miniature drifters. These are very small, only about maybe 30, 20 to 30 centimeters uh, long. And that little cup on the end is a, is a, a satellite iridium communications to send data. We would deploy this in the surf zone. This was developed for the Navy to um, basically drop out of helicopters and surf zones when they wanted to understand if they could see through the water. Um, because in hostile territories, there are often, um, or there can be, um, things like mines and stuff placed in surf zones. So they have to be very careful about understanding where those are. And they have imaging systems that can detect those from helicopters, but only uh, when the visibility is good enough. So this, these drifters would tell them if the visibility was good enough. This is a pretty cool... Um, platform for doing surf zone measurements as well. Uh, it's called the CRAB, Coastal Research Amphibious Buggy. And this is at a, a U.S. Army Corps of Engineer facility in Duck, North Carolina, where a lot of Navy research has been done over the years uh, in the surf zone. So we worked off this platform a few years ago and um, deployed some instruments that looked at bubble concentrations and again, bubbles are one of those things that uh, you know substantially degrade visibility through surf zones. So that's why we were interested in looking at their concentrations and how they fluctuated over time with different sized waves and other environmental parameters. So a very, very neat place to work. Then of course, uh, another platform is the, the human diver. And uh, these are you know, divers are obviously needed in some cases where uh, you have, you know, very fine manipulation of a sensor underwater, like a, a camera system oftentimes. Like in the upper right there is one of my postdocs, Brendan Russell, with a camera system. And he was looking at the reflectance off the bottom. And bottom reflectance changes if you have, you know, if it's just sand, it looks very bright. If you have a lot of algae on it, then it looks darker green. If it's a lot of organic mud, can look very very dark brown. In the middle there is a is a AUV that I haven't uh, mentioned to you guys before, but it's called the Wave Glider, and it's basically a surfboard at the surface with sensors on it that you can put out in the middle of the ocean. And there's an umbilical going down to uh, something that looks like Venetian blinds, but it's like a bungee cord that connects the the, the surfboard to the to the Venetian blinds. So when waves come by, it stretches that umbilical, and when it contracts again, it propels the vehicle forward. That's how it operates. So here we were having some fun just diving around it, looking at how it worked um, before we bought one. This was actually in the middle of, uh, this is off of Hawaii. So yeah, so making measurements in the marine environment is very challenging. Uh, one of the most important challenges is biofouling. We've done a lot of studies actually on biofouling over the years. Uh, the electron micrograph here in the middle is showing the surface, like these are optical windows here, and you can see that some of these are very, very heavily biofouled, not very heavily, but they're biofouled. And this is what it looks like uh, it's a microscopic view. And what you're looking at is basically bacteria that start colonizing surfaces. And once the bacteria start colonizing it, then you're, you're screwed because everything starts growing over the bacteria. In the lower right here, this is a Gulf of Maine deployment where uh, 
we had so much muscle growth on the packages that you couldn't even tell what it was. But amazingly, most of the sensors were still working because um, we use things like copper um, as a, 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 a biological retardant in water, or it's actually quite effective. So we use copper tubing and copper surfaces to, um, to uh, help uh, minimize any biological growth. But the surfaces that don't have those copper um, surfaces, uh, they copper materials, uh, you'll get a lot of biological growth in some environments. Um, the sea state obviously is also important. You can see here some huge waves in the Southern Ocean cruise that I mentioned before. And this was actually um, the, the CTD, which stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. So we measure temp depth, temperature, and salinity. And then we put some other sensors on it as well. But this is vertically de deployed off a ship. So it's tethered to the ship. And these are the Niskan bottles. But it, because of the waves, it was banged on the side of the ship and the entire frame cracked. Um, pretty incredible force to do that. There's also high pressure, obviously. As you drop through the water column, the pressure increases tremendously. Uh, you can get some just insane pressures at very deep depths like the Marianas Trench. Um, so you have to build your sensors to withstand that. So we have a lot of uh, you know, engineering programs that we use to, uh, to do that. There's strong temperature gradients. And when you have electronics underwater trying to you know, send light, through the water and op operating detectors and stuff to measure the return or whatever you're trying to do electronically underwater. A lot of times those components are very sensitive to temperature changes. So at the surface, it can be up to 30 degrees C in the Gulf of Mexico. And then once you get out to a thousand meters, it you know can be close to just a, a you know single digits. So um, that's a big temperature gradient. And if you're if you're taking a quick vertical profile, um, you have to develop compensation techniques with the electronics. Um, otherwise, you'll have big drifts in what you're trying to measure. So electrochemistry, so water, particularly seawater, is, is highly, highly conductive. Um, and it very quickly erodes um, metals that you put in the water unless it's something like titanium which is probably the most resistant stainless steel is also quite resistant but even that will even high grade stainless steel will start to degrade over time so it's a very challenging environment for long-term deployments limited communications so you know unlike the air where we have satellite communications we have wi-fi with a whole variety of frequencies that we can use to communicate wirelessly in air None of that works underwater. So uh, most of what we do is with very, very low speed acoustics, sending basically sound pings through the water. Uh, what people are trying to develop now are, are optical um, laser communication techniques. But uh, it's very difficult because as light propagates through water, it gets scattered. And so um, you lose a lot of your signal. So it's very challenging. Animals can also be a a challenge and this um, this was actually in the South Pacific you can see how clear the water is it's almost violet but we were deploying some instrument and a shark was trying to eat it so the cook came out with a fish head to divert the, the shark over here so um, this is a video of that this is working in uh, the Florida Keys with the camera system uh, that the Navy uses and uh, we were developing um, performance prediction algorithms for the camera because they they were using the camera and they saw you know in some waters they could see far and some waters they couldn't see and they wanted to understand why so that's what we helped them do um, and this camera system here is looking up and you can see on the bottom of the boat we have contrast panels so white to black so full contrast across the bottom of the boat and we drop it through the, the camera through the water column until we couldn't see the contrast anymore. At Harbor Branch, we do laser imaging. And we can do this on the bottom to, to image stuff on the bottom, map out stuff on the bottom. We can also image fish, which is being used around things like underwater turbines. 
right now by the dog leash lab. But we have a, a big world, world class tank at Harbor Branch for doing these kinds of measurements, which is really exciting. We're actually doing some work in bioluminescence in those tanks um, right now. Camouflage is also a very interesting uh, optical phenomenon in the ocean. So obviously organisms can change their color. They can change the pattern of those colors. They can sometimes change the texture of their um, tissues to mimic what's around them. This is really an excellent, excellent example of octopus camouflage, which is some of the most sophisticated camouflage in the ocean. This is taken by Roger Hanlon at Woods Hole. So the octopus is matching the incredible ability to camouflage the pattern, the color, the brightness, and the, the 3D texture, the shape of the, the algae. Um, and we're still trying to, to figure out exactly how they do that. Um, it's actually quite complicated, but uh, the Navy's has funded some work in this that we've been involved in over the years because obviously it could be useful if they could figure out how to camouflage stuff underwater similar to an octopus to, to hide what they're doing. Um, this is a study that we did in, uh, a few years ago that was published in Science and this was looking at polarization. I don't know if you guys have, have learned about polarization in, in your physics class yet, but essentially light travels in waves. Light from the sun, that wave travels in all orientations. So up in the upper right here, you can see light coming in, traveling in all orientations. All these different waves have no directionality. They're in all directions. But once it hits a surface, you have polarized light, preferentially polarized light. So that in this direction, you primarily get light scattered in the horizontal plane. And this is the concept behind uh, polarized sunglasses. So if you're looking ahead of you when you're driving your car and you see light that's uh, reflected off the rear window of a vehicle, that's primarily going to be horizontally polarized. So you wear sunglasses that are vertically polarized, so it's rejecting the horizontal. So uh, the that reflection is much, much less intense. So anyway, uh, camouflage underwater is, is, is a very, very important phenomenon. There's many, many different ways to do it. One way is that fish scales, and we've known this for a long time, fish scales obviously act like mirrors. And the, way they, the reason they do that is because if you're looking up in the water, if that light from the sun is being reflected off those fish scales, it's gonna have a very similar color and intensity to the water surrounding the fish. So they're effectively camouflaged. That's why they do that. But one thing that we realized in the study is that a lot of predators have the ability to filter light of different polarizations. So uh, if the fish scales were acting like a mirror, you would get, as in the upper right diagram here, preferentially polarized light, whereas the light surrounding the fish would be unpolarized. So in terms of if you had like if you're wearing your polarized sunglasses as a as a predator fish, that that fish would not be that would not be camouflaged well. And what we found out in this study is that fish scales are made of the special substance called guanine, guanine platelets, and they not only reflect the light, but in the process they also scramble the polarization, so it looks like the water around it. So it was a very very cool study. Um, and it just showed that not only the intensity and color is being replicated by the fish scales through the reflection, but also the, the polarization. So the angular, the orientation of the, the, those light, pet, light beams through the water was also being mimicked. And then one other um, phenomenon in the ocean, this is the last uh, slide I think I have, is the deep scattering layer. And this is something that occurs throughout the global oceans. It's the largest migration that occurs on the planet. And it occurs twice a day. It occurs in the morning, which is what we're showing here in the lower left. So this is acoustic detection of animal migration. So at the surface, we have an acoustic device. It's looking at multiple frequencies. Each frequency is looking at a different size organism. And during the morning, from 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock, 
you can see these ribbons or these filaments coming from the surface down to the deep water. That's because these organisms come to the surface at night to feed on the phytoplankton, so they graze. And they do it at night because their predators use vision through the water to find them and eat them. So when the light starts to come, the sun starts to come up, then they dive through the water column down to deep depths between 400 and 600 meters where the light is so low that the predators can't find them. So they're hiding. So they hide during the day and then at nighttime, the ex exact reverse happens. Starting at about well, at dusk, they'll come to the surface. These different filaments represent different types of organisms that are each following different constant light levels. And so uh, we studied this, we mapped out this phenomenon with the acoustics, and then we used our radiometer systems to measure the actual light fields and to figure out which, um, what we call isolooms. These are constant light levels that these different organisms are, are following. So it was a really cool study. But this is, this is a very poorly understood, uh, it's, it's getting more, you know, it's getting better understood just because of the advent of this new technology, acoustics, to study um, these migrations. But this is uh, something that we still have a lot to learn. Uh, you know, there have been some estimates that like 80% of the fish biomass in the ocean is at these deeper mesopelagic depths between, say, 300 and 600 meters. So we need to learn a lot more about the 